Good evening to you. Good evening. Good to see everybody again tonight. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles to Leviticus 23 once again, if you will, please. Leviticus chapter 23. going to seek to conclude our series of lessons on the Feast of the Lord this evening. And thus far we have covered four of the seven. We've covered all of the spring feasts there that take place in the first part of Israel's religious or ecclesiastical year. And tonight what we've got to cover and what we've got to wrap up with are the final three that take place in the fall season. And as we've come through this, uh, we've been trying to emphasize the point that all of these typify the Lord Jesus Christ in some way. Uh, the spring feast specifically speak of his meek and lowly coming, the sufferings of Christ. And what we're going to find tonight as we get into the fall feast is that those typify his coming in power and great glory. And uh, some marvelous things that we're going to be able to look at tonight with the Lord's help. And uh, since we've got three to wrap up with tonight, uh, obviously we're going to be going through them a little bit quicker than we did um, in some of the others. And that's not because they're any less important. It's just uh, the nature of the, the amount of time we've got to go through these things. And so hopefully we'll be able to look at some things that will be a help uh, to you and increase our understanding here in the knowledge of the Lord. Let's pick up here in Leviticus 23. I want to start in verse 23. And the first feast that we have for consideration this evening is the Feast of Trumpets. Leviticus 23 and verse number 23. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now when you come to the Feast of Trumpets and these fall feasts, I think the first thing you've got to point out is that from where we left off in verse 22, when we were talking about the Feast of Pentecost, from verse 22 to 23, you're jumping a number of months. Uh, Pentecost, of course, we said last time, falls within the third month of Israel's religious calendar. And now as you come to the Feast of Trumpets, beginning in verse 23, you're skipping all the way over from month 3 into the seventh month. As uh, it says there in uh, verse 23, I believe it is, or verse 24 rather. Um, verse 24, speaking to the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, in the first day of the month shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial blowing of trumpets, and holy convocation. And so you're coming to the third major time in which all the males in Israel are being called to appear before the Lord in Jerusalem. Uh, the first set of three feasts here, of course, is the first time that they come up. That cluster of feasts with Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Uh, you've got that space of 50 days there between first fruits and the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. That's the second time the males appear before the Lord there. And then finally, as you come over to the seventh month of the year, for the fall feast, you begin with trumpets for the third time that all of Israel's males were to go up. And so uh, what we see is that there's a, there's a space of time there. Uh, you're skipping completely over months four, five, and six. Uh, if memory serves, I believe, on Israel's calendar, that's the month of uh, Tammuz, Ab, and Elul. And then you come to the seventh month. And it's in, uh, it's 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 8 verse number 2, you can get the reference for the name of the seventh month. And the seventh month is called Ethanim. And trumpets, it says, takes place on the first day of that seventh month. So Ethanim 1 is where you're at when you come to the Feast of Trumpets there. The Jews also uh, call that seventh month by the name Tishri. Uh, that's in connection with their civil calendar. Uh, which is a little bit different than the religious calendar. Uh, this is primarily concerned with the religious calendar, so it's month seven. But on their civil calendar, which is a little bit different, that's actually the first month of the year. And that's why they call it Tishri. That means beginning. It's the beginning of their civil year uh, there on the first of Tishri. We're going with the uh, religious calendar name there, though. Ethan M1. 
and uh, you've got the Feast of Trumpets being held on that first day of the seventh month. So what's supposed to happen on Ethan M1? Well, verse 24, as we read, it says, Ye shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. And so you've got this, this issue of a memorial of trumpets that's to take place on the first day of the seventh month there. This, as I said, the beginning of the third time of the year in which all the males are commanded to assemble in Jerusalem. Um, as we said, we saw that breakdown a moment ago. And they're to have a holy convocation here as they get underway with the final feast of their religious year. And they're going to get it underway with this memorial of a blowing of trumpets. And again, part of the reason why they're doing this and the reason they're sounding these trumpets at this particular time is in connection with uh, the beginning of something new. As I said, on the civil calendar, it's the first day of their first month. And so it's the beginning of the civil new year. Uh, they're at the, the Feast of Trumpets, and they're, uh, they're blowing some trumpets in celebration of uh, a new beginning, if you will. And um, that's all taking place there on the first of that seventh month. So essentially what you have in this feast is a celebration, a blowing of trumpets for a new beginning. It's the end of the harvest seasons. Now you're coming to the fall period, and in connection with that, the Lord tells them he wants them to have a holy convocation there in Jerusalem. Now what's the significance of the blowing of trumpets when it comes to the people of Israel? Well, the Bible tells us something about that. If you come over to Numbers chapter 10, Numbers chapter 10, you find some verses here that speak of the significance of trumpets when it comes to the nation Israel. Numbers chapter 10, verse number 1. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver. Of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. When you blow an alarm, then the camp that lie on the east part shall go forward. When you blow an alarm the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journeys. But when the congregation is to be gathered together, ye shall blow, but ye shall not sound an alarm. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and you shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. Also, in the day of your gladness, and in your solemn days, and in the beginning, or the beginnings of your months, ye you shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God, I am the Lord your God. So what you can see there is that the blowing of trumpets clearly gets linked up to this, this issue of the congregation of Israel being gathered together. If you look there in verse 7 again, but when the congregation is to be gathered together, ye shall blow. So the blowing of trumpets has to do with a calling together of an assembly. When the, the, the trumpet sounds, that, that sound pierces the airwaves, and they hear that, uh, there, there's this issue of where there's supposed to be an assembly before uh, the tabernacle, in this case here, as they're in the wilderness there. And so there's a gathering together of Israel in connection with this that is to take place on Ethan M1 as they begin these fall feasts. And uh, as I said, it's, it's a calling together to, for a celebration of a new beginning in connection with the consummation of Jehovah's purpose with them as typified in the feast. And uh, there's some real significance to that when it comes to uh, the prophetic issue of the gathering together of Israel. And that's what we want to talk about for a few moments right now. We want to talk about the antitype of trumpets. Uh, what's the antitype of which trumpets is the shadow or type. Well, to understand that, the first thing you've got to do is back up a little bit. And you have to understand, first of all, that starting back at the end of the books of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, the nation Israel becomes scattered. They go into captivity. Uh, the northern kingdom, they are taken into captivity by the Assyrians. 
the southern kingdom of Judah ends up in captivity to the Babylonians. And Israel, that was in that land of Canaan, where they had been planted, when Joshua brought them in, following the death of Moses, they were residing in the land for a while. They had their kingdom, uh, that, that Davidic kingdom that had been established there. But because of their transgressions of the law, ultimately God scatters them out of the land. And the Gentiles come in, Jerusalem's decimated, the temple's destroyed, and uh, the, the people are carried away into the lands of the Gentiles. And they're scattered among the heathen, as the Bible would say. And that, that remains throughout the rest of God's purpose and program with the people of Israel. Now, after 70 years of that initial captivity, there was a remnant of Jews that were permitted to go back into the land. Ezra, Nehemiah, the Esther time frames about that remnant going back into the land after their captivity. But even when they were permitted to return, you realize that that was only a very small handful of Jews that were permitted back into the land. For the, for the most part, Israel remained scattered out there among the Gentiles. They're just all over the place. The sheep have been scattered. And when you understand that that's the situation that, they're, that they got themselves into at that point there, and that, that condition remains, you can come over to Isaiah 27 and you can read some verses here about uh, something that the Lord has to say to Israel in connection with that scattered condition that they find themselves in. Prophet Isaiah in chapter 27 Isaiah actually prophesies to Israel before those captivities take place, but he's, he's announcing the fact that it's coming. And he's announced the doom and gloom of that, that judgment of God against them. But here in uh, chapter 27 and verse 12, notice what he says. He says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt. He says, And ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcasts of the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. Now, isn't that amazing? You've got this issue of the trumpet coming up, don't you? There's going to be a sounding of a great trumpet in which Jehovah says that Israel that has been scattered out there among the nations are going to be gathered one by one. As they're dispersed out there among the Gentile nations, God says at the blowing of a trumpet, he's going to gather Israel back into that land and they're going to worship the Lord. Where does it say? In the holy mount in Jerusalem. Right. That's in the land of Israel. Specifically, it's in Judah, that southern kingdom there, that, that city of the great king. They're going to be gathered from among the nations and brought back into their land where they're going to worship the Lord. The blowing of the trumpet. Israel's regathering from their scattered condition. Now, when's that going to take place? When is Israel going to be gathered together? When's that trumpet going to be blown for them to be regathered? Come over to Matthew 24. Gospel of Matthew chapter 24. We've got the words of the Lord here. He's uh, speaking what's commonly referred to as the Olivet Discourse. And he's telling these Israelites here what to anticipate when it comes to the issue of the tribulation period. And ultimately, the return of the Lord to the earth at the end of that time. And uh, we, we don't need to, to mistake what we're about to read here. This is not a reference to what we commonly call the rapture of the church, the body of Christ, into the heavens, called up to be with Him in there. That's our hope as the body of Christ. That's not what He's talking about here in Matthew 24, but He's talking about His return and power and great glory and His revelation to the earth to establish the kingdom. And watch what He says here in verse 29. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Notice verse 31. It says, and he shall send his angels with the sound of or a great sound of a trumpet, 
And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. You see, the antitypes being talked about there. What trumpets stood for. And that, that issue of the trumpets and the calling together of Israel. He's talking about after the tribulation of those days. After that seven year period where great, the great wrath of the Lord has been poured out upon this earth. At that time when the Son of Man is going to return physically and visibly to this earth. He says there's going to be sounding of a great trumpet. He's going to dispatch his angelic host. And they're going to go out and they're going to gather up his elect. That, that, that believing remnant of Israel that's scattered out there among the nations. And bring them back into the land. The regathering of Israel. And he says there that when, when all this is going to take place after the tribulation period. And that judgment of God has been poured out. He talks about how the sun is going to be darkened. The moon's not going to give her light. God's going to put the world in complete darkness at the end of that seven year period. No light whatsoever. Similar to the way that it was talked about back there in Egypt when God put darkness in the land. It says it was darkness that could be felt. God's going to cut all the lights out after his day of wrath. The whole world's going to be in darkness. The sun's not going to give its light. The moon obviously is not going to reflect the sun. The stars are going to fall from heaven. And the world's going to be in complete darkness. No light whatsoever. And he says, then they're going to see the sign of the Son of Man coming in heaven. Amen. What's going to happen is, in the world's in complete darkness, the Lord from the heavens, he's going to rend that curtain of the heavens as the Psalms would describe. He's going to come down. And what the inhabitants of the earth are going to see when they're in that period of darkness where they can't discern what day or what hour it is, complete darkness. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, coming out of the east like lightning across the sky, they're going to see the sign of the Son of Man coming back to this earth in power and in great glory to establish His kingdom. He's going to sound that trumpet, dispatch His angels. They're going to go from one end of the heaven to the other, the Bible says, gathering up His dispersed nation, bringing them back into Jerusalem. And they're going to worship the Lord there as He establishes the kingdom. There's a blowing of a trumpet in connection with that. And so... And the antitype here, you have his return. Or you could say his revelation. Not to be confused with the rapture of the church. Or we're called out to meet the Lord in the air. But this is his physical and visible return to the earth for Israel. The revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of those days. The Feast of Trumpets typifies that. The gathering together of Israel into the fold of the kingdom. Let's look over at um, one other passage. Jeremiah chapter 16, if you will. Prophet Jeremiah chapter 16. Verse 14. What we want to pick up. Jeremiah 16 and verse 14. The Bible says, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he had driven them. And I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. Does that sound familiar? Make you become fishers of men? He's going to send them fishers to gather them. They shall fish them, and after will I send for many hunters. And they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. For mine eyes are upon all their ways. They are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. And first I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double. Because they have defiled my land, they have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable things. O Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. Shall a man make gods unto himself, and they are no gods? Therefore, behold, I will this once cause them to know, I will cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. It's a connection with him coming back to establish that kingdom. 
putting Israel back in that land in accordance with his purpose with them. And he says, when that happens, the name of the Lord is going to be published throughout all the earth. And they're going to know my name. They're going to know what Jehovah and that name is all about when he sanctifies Israel in their midst. They're gathered back in the land. The blowing of the trumpets there. The regathering of Israel. The establishment of the kingdom. Now let's go over to Exodus 17. Exodus 17. We'll look at the educational component of this feast here. The Jehovah compound name. It speaks of what goes on in connection with the fulfillment of trumpets here. Exodus 17 and verse number 8. It says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose out or choose us out men, and go and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Ur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Ur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, Jehovah and Nisi. And he said, Because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So the context here, specifically Israel out there in the wilderness, is facing a conflict of warfare. Specifically war with Amalek. And, and the Lord is actually conducting the battle on behalf of Israel against their enemies there. Uh, Numbers 24.20 says that Amalek was the first of the nations. Speaking of this event here, the first of the nations that opposed God's purpose with Israel after he brought them out of Egypt. And they're facing some enemies here out there in the wilderness. And uh, the Lord here in connection with this event has Moses uh, build this altar and he, he swears that he's utterly going to put out the remembrance of Amalek, Israel's enemies from under heaven, verse 14. And as Moses built this altar in connection with this event, he called the name of that altar Jehovah Nissi. Right? Jehovah Nisi. That's I am your victory. Or I am your banner. Victory flag, so to speak. I'm your hero. In connection with the enemies of God that are coming against his purpose with Israel. He, he's teaching them there through that event early on after he brings them out of Egypt that their hope in being what his plan and purpose calls for, their hope in overcoming their enemies is not in themselves. It's not in their military genius or in the, the, the wisdom of Joshua as their leader, but their victory is to be found in Jehovah. Jehovah's going to fight their battles for them. He's going to destroy their enemies and drive out their enemies before them in order to gather them back into that land. I'm your victory, he says. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ will be for Israel when he comes at his revelation or his return. Everything's going to look like Israel's going to be wiped out. Their back's going to be against the wall. Their enemies are going to be getting ready to pounce upon them for the last time and to rid their name from the earth. And about that time when it looks like Israel's going down for the last time and they're going to perish, that's when the Lord Jesus Christ will break through the heavens and come down with the sword proceeding out of his mouth in great fury, wipe the floor with Israel's enemies and establish his rule and reign in the kingdom on this earth. He's going to be their victory. Their victory flag. And when that happens, all they're going to be able to do is praise the name of the Lord as the Psalms talk about. That's all they're going to be able to do is just praising the issue of his Jehovah name and, and what that has accomplished on their behalf as their victory. How that he has gathered them back into the land. He has destroyed their enemies. In one place, I can't remember the reference right off, but uh, the, the Lord says, I think it's in Isaiah, he says, I have treading the winepress alone. See, when the Lord comes back, he comes to fight the battle 
They're, he, he's not coming back with a, an army of angels coming with him, but they're not coming to fight. He's going to destroy the enemies of Israel with the sword of his mouth. He's going to tread the winepress alone. And the name of the Lord alone is going to be extolled and praised. And the impact of that, when the world sees the Lord Jesus Christ coming back in power and great glory, the impact of that, and the fact that he has sanctified Israel in the midst of the nations, established them there in the center of the earth, it's going to cause the Gentiles to want to go to Jerusalem and worship the king there as well. Amen. That's the purpose of the kingdom. And he says in connection with all that, I'm your victory, Israel. I'm your Jehovah Nissi. All right, let's come over to John chapter 11. Statement of the Lord Jesus Christ here. Corresponds with this. John chapter 11. John 11 and verse 21. It says, Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. This is the context of the death of Lazarus, of course. And she says, But I know that even now, whatsoever thou would ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. So the I am statement of the Lord Jesus Christ there, obviously, is I am the resurrection and the life. And notice it's the resurrection and the life. It's not just the resurrection, but it's the resurrection and the life. And he's, he's speaking this here in, in the context of Jews, what Israel would be understanding from the Old Testament scriptures about what Messiah is going to do and the establishment of his kingdom. And he's declaring here in connection with the death of Lazarus that he is the resurrection and the life. And he's doing that because uh, when he said that your brother's going to rise again, Martha says, well, I know that he's going to rise again at the last day. Back there in the Old Testament, God said that he was going to resurrect the believers in Israel to go into that kingdom. The doctrine of resurrection was taught back there, and she understood that. And she's, she's saying that to the Lord, but he declares this great statement here, and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, what's he mean by that? Well, he goes on to explain it there. He says, he that... Believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Well, that was Lazarus' condition, wasn't it? Lazarus had believed upon Jesus as the Christ. He had believed that, that gospel of the kingdom that had been preached to him, but yet Lazarus here, before the kingdom is established, is dead. And he's given Martha the hope here that he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Those believers in Israel that died before the kingdom was established still have the hope of entering into it because... He's going to raise them up. I'm the resurrection. He goes on there. He says, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. See, I'm the resurrection and the life. Some of Israel, through that tribulation period, are going to endure to the end. They're going to live. And when he returns to establish his kingdom at that day, they're still going to be physically alive on the earth having never tasted death. But they believe in him, and he says that though they live, they'll never die. When they enter into that kingdom, they're never going to taste of death. And he says, I am that. I'm the victory over all your enemies. Physical, yes, but I'm, I'm, I'm your victory over the issue of death, too. If you die, I'm the resurrection. Amen. But I'm also the life for that, that nation that endures to the end. They're going to be given that eternal life without ever tasting of death as they enter into the kingdom there. I am the resurrection and life. In John 5, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. It's in functioning as the resurrection and the life there. He's their victory. So that's the issue with trumpets. All that's going to take place when he returns. When he returns, Israel is going to be gathered together into that land. Those that are still alive, 
have entrance, to be kind of worthy to stand before the Son of Man, having never tasted death, and those that have died in the Lord and passed will be raised to enter the kingdom there at his establishment at his return. Okay? Let's go back to Leviticus 23. We'll move on to feast 6. Leviticus 23. This is the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 23 and verse 26. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul shall or will I destroy from among his people. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls. In the ninth day of the month, at even, from even unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. So the sixth feast here on Israel's religious calendar is this Day of Atonement. If you look there at verse 27 once again, you find that this holy day is on the tenth day of this seventh month, he says. So you're still in the same month of the religious calendar, as you have a trumpet, but this is on day 10. So that means that Ethanim 10 is where they're to observe this Day of Atonement. Every year they're to observe this. And he says that it's from the ninth day at even, or 6 p.m., it's even unto even, the tenth day. Israel's days start in the evening, the evening and the morning were the first day. And so from the evening on the night to the evening on the 10th, you've got the Day of Atonement there on Ethanim 10. This was one of those days in Israel that was considered to be a special Sabbath that they were to observe. We read how they were to afflict their souls. You can do some cross-references on that. That simply means that they're to be fasting on that day. If a man afflicts his soul, he does that by fasting. And um, also he says they're to do no work. Right? This, this is a Sabbath day, or to do no servile work therein. And the reason, verse 28, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. Now, if you want some other details on what the day of atonement is all about, there's actually a lot of detail on it back a few chapters in Leviticus chapter 16. There's a whole lot of instruction on what the priest was supposed to do on the day of atonement. And you can go back, and I'd encourage you to read that later on on your own but one of the interesting things about the day of atonement and what took place there was that in addition to all of the offerings that they were typically offering there was this issue of what we're calling the the scapegoat there were two goats that were chosen out of the flock the priest would select two and they would actually cast lots over these two goats whichever goat upon which the lot of the lord fell that goat was taken and it was slain and offered on the altar. But the other goat, that one was referred to as the scapegoat. And what would happen is that Aaron, in the, case, in the first case, the first high priest, what he would do with the scapegoat is he would lay his hands upon the head of the scapegoat there and he would begin to confess the iniquities and the transgressions of the nation Israel. Their transgressions of the law covenant. He began to confess those with his hands on the head of the goat there. Now, let's actually, let's look back at Leviticus 16, just a couple of verses there on that, uh, so you can see this. Uh, Leviticus 16, verse 21. It says, And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions, and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away, by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness, and the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Right? So he's, he's got both of his hands there laid upon the head of this goat. He's confessing the sins and the transgressions of the nation Israel. And then with a, a fit man or a strong man, after uh, the priest has done that, he's to lead that scapegoat out into the wilderness, and he's to let it go. So you've got this, this two-goat picture. One goat 
is satisfying the, the justice of God upon sin and that it's taken and it's slain as an offering unto the Lord. And then you've got this issue of the scapegoat where the sins are confessed, a picture of the transference of Israel's guilt to the head of the goat, and then that's carried out into the wilderness to a land not inhabited, never to be seen again. So what you've got in this picture is the issue of substitutionary propitiation in the goat that is slaughtered. And you also have the issue of the separation of Israel from their sins and transgressions under the old covenant being carried away, never to be seen again. That takes us to the antitype which really is a fulfillment of what that, that all speaks to. And for the antitype, I'd like you to come over to Jeremiah 20, or 31, rather. Jeremiah 31. I have to lay a little bit of groundwork here so that we understand what, what's going on with this. Israel, of course, at Sinai came under the law. It came to be known as the Old Covenant, which they failed under miserably. The, the confession of the priests in connection with the scapegoat, of course, was acknowledgement of that fact. They couldn't keep that. And here in Jeremiah, he promises to give the house of Judah and Israel a new covenant. Jeremiah 31 and 31, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. What you've got there is Jehovah promising the house of Israel, the house of Judah, those 12 tribes, all in all there. He's promising to make a new covenant with them. And what this covenant is covenanting for is for the Lord to supply them with spiritual fitness by supernaturally internalizing the law in their hearts. God's going to supernaturally empower the believers in Israel that come under the new covenant with the ability to do righteousness. See, it, the, the, the old covenant was an external system. It, it's a law that works on your flesh. Getting my flesh to do something and my covenant they break, he said. They couldn't keep it. But the new covenant, God is promising Israel that he's going to supernaturally empower them to be able to perform righteousness. He's going to, he's going to uh, write it on their hearts, he says. Put it on their inward parts. Cause them to walk in his ways, which they couldn't do in the power of the flesh there. He's covenanting for their spiritual fitness and they give this to them. And he says that I'm going to forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more, verse 34. Just like that picture of the scapegoat back there uh, where, where Israel's transgressions under the old covenant are being transferred to the head of that goat and being taken away. So when the new covenant comes and it's established, God is going to literally, on the basis of his substitutionary propitiation, which took place back here, at Passover, the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he offered himself up to God, on the basis of what was accomplished there, he is going to forgive their sins and remember their iniquity no more, separating Israel from their transgressions under the old covenant, bringing them into the new covenant to take them into the kingdom so that they can be that holy nation that he called them to be before the Gentiles. A supernatural empowering to do that. Okay? Okay. Now come over to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. The Apostle Paul here in this section of Romans is speaking about this issue of how God, though he has interrupted his purpose with Israel to do something different with the body of Christ, he fully intends to go back and to finish this thing out. And he's talking about that issue of the new covenant that Jeremiah brought up. And in uh, Romans 11 and verse 26, notice when he says all this is going to be taking place. Romans eleven twenty six. 26, it says, And so 
all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, notice this, it says, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. See? Their sins are being taken away. They're being separated from them. Never to be seen again. Bringing them under the new covenant. That's the issue of atonement. See? See, this issue, the day of atonement, this is about a national atonement. An atonement for Israel in which they're brought into a different covenant. Now, Passover back here, that's the issue of personal atonement. And on the basis of the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished, the Apostle Paul says today, as a member of the body of Christ, Romans chapter 5, by him we now have received the atonement. That's talking about personal atonement. Every man brings a lamb back here at Passover. Remember that? Every man brings a lamb. Personal atonement. Over here, this is the issue of Israel's national atonement. He's going to separate their sins from them nationally and make them into that holy nation that they couldn't be on their own. And he says there in verse 27, this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Speaking nationally. That's not happened yet. Israel's sins have not been taken away yet. Their transgression of the old covenant have not been taken away yet. But it will. It's the day of atonement. Okay. Look at Acts chapter 3. Here's another verse on this. Peter here. Speaking to the house of Israel. Notice how he's, he's just going to be speaking here exactly what the prophets have been saying. Acts chapter 3, verse 18. He's there speaking to them about how they, they had rejected their Messiah, crucified the Holy One, and so forth. Verse 18, he says, But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When? When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time for the restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. See, he's talking to the house of Israel, and he's speaking about that national atonement out here. See, he says that your sins are going to be taken away, not the instant that you believe, that's personal atonement they will, but speaking to them nationally, he says, when the times of restitution come. At the presence of the Lord. When the Lord is physically present there to establish the kingdom, national atonement takes place. All that old covenant system is, is done away and they're brought under the new covenant at the kingdom. He's pointing them to the future. And it's what the prophets have been speaking about since the world began, he says there. It's what they've been speaking all along. Peter's just saying the same exact thing there. Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. I won't take time to read that, but there's some really interesting verses over there in Hebrews chapter 9 and 10 that speak specifically about that day of atonement and what the priest did. And it talks about those issues to the Hebrews there in connection with the day of atonement. Let's go to Jeremiah 23, if you will. Look at the Jehovah compound name here real quick. It goes with their atonement. Jeremiah chapter 23. Verse 5. Jeremiah 23, 5. He says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. See, now again, fill in the antitype here. This is his redemption. That's national redemption of Israel. And this, the Lord our righteousness is a Jehovah compound. That's Jehovah Zidkenu. T-S-I-D-K-E-N-U. And that's the Lord our righteousness. And that's national righteousness. Right? 
under the new covenant. I'm going to take away your sins. Cause you to walk in my ways. Internalize the law so that you can perform that righteousness. And so that's what his name is going to be called on that day. When he brings them under that new covenant, when he establishes his kingdom at his return, and they receive the, the redemption... And that new covenant issue, he says in that day his name is going to be called the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah's in canoe. John 14. Words of the Lord Jesus Christ here. John 14. I think you're familiar with this one. Very common verse here. John 14, verse number 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So he's the way, truth, and life. He's Israel's way into the kingdom. He's the truth about how they're going to inherit the kingdom. He's the life they'll receive in the kingdom. He's the true way that they need to be following, not the way of Cain. And works religion promoted by the Pharisees. He's the truth about that issue, not like the error of Balaam. And he's the life, unlike the perishing, the gainsaying of court. He's got the authority to get them in the kingdom. He's the one that's going to bring about the new covenant for Israel. He's declaring it to them there. I'm your way, truth, and life when it comes to the issue of righteousness. He's supplying it. All right. Let's hurry on. We'll look at the final one here. Back in Leviticus 23. Feast number 7. This is the Feast of Tabernacles. Leviticus 23, verse 33. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speaking to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you. And you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, and you shall do no servile work therein. These are the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering, and a meat offering, a sacrifice, and drink offering, everything upon his day. Beside the Sabbaths of the Lord, and beside your gifts, and beside all your vows, and beside all your freewill offerings which ye give unto the Lord. Also, in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when ye are gathered, or when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And ye shall take you uh, on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, and the branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. And ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. Ye shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. That your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And Moses declared unto the children of Israel the feasts of the Lord. So now you come to the final of the seven feasts, the Feast of Tabernacles. It's called there verse number 34. This is yet another week-long feast that is uh, booked in by a pair of uh, special Sabbaths on the first and the eighth day. And uh, if you cast your eyes down there to verse 34 again, it says that this Feast of Tabernacles was set to begin on the 15th day of the seventh month. And so it begins on Ethan M. 15. It runs for a week long, and then on that eighth day, you've got that second special Sabbath. And so Tabernacles, the dates there is Ethanim 15 to 22. Eight days. Holy Convocation or Sabbath on the first, and then the eighth. Number of new beginnings. Starting something new, they're to hold another there. And they're to dwell in booths, as it says there. Or tabernacles made out of these boughs of goodly trees, palms and, and willows, as it says there. And they're to dwell in those, those tabernacles of those booths for the duration of that, that week-long feast there. That's what they're doing. Verse uh, 42 and 43, again, you got that issue. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. 
And that's the issue of the memorial, of the, the fact that God made them to dwell in, Israel, in uh, booths in the wilderness there. And so, once again, about a memorial of remembrance concerning what the Lord did for their fathers when he brought them out of Egypt. And uh, also a shadow of some things to come, as, as we've seen with these other feasts as well. And so, what is the Feast of, of Tabernacles shadow? Or what's the antitype of the Feast of Tabernacles? We'll come over to John chapter 1, first of all. John chapter 1. John 1 and verse 1. You notice there it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now obviously John 1 is about the incarnation of Lord Jesus Christ. That Word that was God made flesh. And it dwelt among us, John says. That, that dwelt among us. They're literally the word tabernacled among us is what that means. He dwelt in a booth or a tabernacle of flesh, if you will. Jehovah manifest in flesh. John is declaring that issue. He's full of grace and truth. The issue of Jehovah's name. He's full of Jehovahness, we could say it that way. He's very God. And he dwells among Israel there. John says so. He says he dwelt among us. Now come back to Matthew chapter 1 and notice another issue in connection with this. Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. He quotes here from Isaiah chapter 7. Matthew 1, 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Uh, I read verse 23, but back up to verse 22. It says, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall conceive, or shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God with us. That's what the name Emmanuel means. Again, a quotation from Isaiah 7 and verse 14. Now the prophet declared that when Messiah come, that they would call his name Emmanuel, didn't he? And we know that he was God in flesh when he came in his meek and lowly coming back here, when he tabernacled among men. But the problem is that if you, and that does, by the way, it's, it's quoted in connection with his birth, so that's obviously an issue that's in view there. But it's not just the issue, the fact that he was made flesh, but the fact of what he was ultimately made flesh to accomplish. Obviously, he was made flesh to suffer the death of the cross, obviously. That's true. But really, all that work of the cross was the foundation for what was looking beyond that cross. And the fact that God had said that he was going to set the seed of David's flesh upon his throne. Amen. See? And it says they're going to call his name Emmanuel. When he came back here, they, nobody called his name Emmanuel, did they? You keep reading there in Matthew chapter 1, and it'll go on to say that she brought forth her firstborn son, and they called his name Jesus. That's the man, Jesus. That's the way he was referred to. They didn't call him Emmanuel back there. They didn't say it's God with us. Believers did. They came to understand that. But it doesn't say that she, the virgin, shall call his name Emmanuel. It says they shall call his name Emmanuel. That's a prophecy that's given to the house of David. They're going to call his name Emmanuel or God with us, not strictly in connection with the fact that he's made flesh and dwells among them here, but at his return when he comes to establish the kingdom to sit upon his throne physically there in the land, they are going to call his name Emmanuel. God is with us. Amen. See, God's with Israel. Not just figuratively, not just spiritually, literally. God with the, that's going to be God on the throne in Jerusalem. Jesus Christ, Jehovah in flesh, God's with us. That's Emmanuel. God with us. He's going to tabernacle with us, what he's going to do. Is there Emmanuel? Come over to Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah. 
chapter 8 here. Zechariah 8, verse 20. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall yet come to pass that there shall come people, and the inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord, to seek the Lord of hosts, I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem, and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. That's the Gentiles now, grabbing hold of the skirt of the Jews. And that program, God said the Gentiles have to go through Israel to know the Lord. It's part of the Abrahamic covenant. I will bless them that bless thee. Curse him that curseth thee. They go through Israel. He says, I take hold of the skirt of the Jews. He says, we're going to go with you to Jerusalem. Right. Why? Because we've heard. God's with you. God's with Israel. That, that's the Gentile perspective. God's with them. With that nation. We want to go up there and know the Lord. Because he's our Emmanuel. God with Israel. See? I come over to Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14 and verse 8. It says, And it shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea, in summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. See, that's the kingdom. When Jehovah's there with them. Look at verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep what? The feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no... Uh, that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. In that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. And the pots of the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seed therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Talking about the observance of the Feast of Tabernacles by the Gentiles. Where? In his kingdom. His kingdom. When God is literally there with them in the midst of the land. As their Emmanuel. Come over to Ezekiel 48 and look at the Jehovah compound. Ezekiel 48, very last verse in the book here. Ezekiel 48, here in this last section of Ezekiel, he's been getting a view of the kingdom, measuring out the city. Chapter 40 to 48 here, and at the end of all that, here in Ezekiel 48, 35, it says, and it was round about 18,000 measures and the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there. <coughs> and a translated name this is Jehovah Shema I am there or I am present see in the kingdom He's going to be there in Jerusalem. I'm present. God with us. Jehovah Shabbat. And then finally, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, John chapter 10. Verse 9. Jesus said, 
I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So once again, the Lord Jesus Christ here talking to Israel, the sheep of his pasture. He says, I am the door of the sheep there, back up to verse 7. I'm the door of the sheep. He's the access point for the believers there. The access point by which they'll be able to inherit that kingdom out there. He's the door. And he says, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The Messiah is the door. See, Pharisees and Sadducees and all that vain religion of Israel's system, you can't get in that way. He says, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. They didn't care for the sheep. They'll lead you astray. They leave you to the wolf to be torn apart. But I'm the door. I'm the access point. I'm the one with the authority to take you in there. Therefore, you need to come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden under the burdens of that, that, that oppressive system of the, of the Pharisees. He says, come unto me. I'll give you rest. It says, there's rest. It's the Sabbath of rest. We're going to have rest from their enemies. Be gathered together in that kingdom. He says, I'm the door. And he shall, he that believes on me, he says, shall go in and out and find pasture. That, that's a word of liberty. See? Starting back there with the captivity where they're scattered. They didn't have liberty. They're pressed into the hands of the Gentiles. The Gentiles rule over them. But when they enter into that kingdom, he said, when you enter in, you'll go in and out and find pasture. He's going to restore the kingdom to Israel. They're going to have liberty under that new covenant. And he's the one that's going to be able to give them that. Study Ezekiel 34 and 37 in connection with this, and it becomes all the more clear. They're going to hear his voice. His sheep hear his voice. Because what he's speaking lines up with what the prophet said back there. Yeah. As the shepherd of the sheep, Ezekiel 34 and 37, those that know his voice, they know it and they hear it and they follow him. That's what he says. He's the one that's going to take them in their tabernacle with them there. So to finish this up here, Says, I am the door. When you look at that, what you see is that every single one of these things is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Every last one of them. As their Jehovah who comes to do all these things for them, shadows what the name of the Lord means to them and what he's going to be for them as manifest in the person of Jesus the Messiah. As you begin to see the beauty of it all, you can just behold Him in all that. Amen. Just behold Him. It's about Christ. Now, folks, man didn't do that. No. Man didn't come up with that. God did. And He came up with it and he gave it to Moses, and he had him write it down in the form of a shadow thousands of years before any of it ever started coming to pass. But when the time came for him to put that name into effect on their behalf, what you start seeing is everything starts falling in the line. Bang, 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 one after the other. We've seen it fulfilled. God has so fulfilled it in the sufferings of Christ. It's typified in the spring feasts. His meek and lowly coming. And what he's fulfilled back here gives all the assurance that he will perform all that's left out there. When he comes in power and great glory at his return to bring redemption to the nation Israel, to establish his kingdom, and to reign as the Lord, the King, over all the earth. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can behold him here in the feast of the Lord in Leviticus chapter 23. hope that's been helpful to you. We'll leave it to the Lord's hands from there. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time that you've given us. We pray that you take these things, Lord, and use it in those that have heard. Let's pray that understanding would be increased with the things that we've looked at and that we would get, Lord, just a, a greater appreciation for, Lord, your wisdom, the way that you put all this together, and your faithfulness in the way that you've worked it out. Lord, may your name be honored and glorified the things that have been spoken tonight. Thanks, Christ's name.